Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the AltMed podcast. It is summertime in Melbourne, so I'm wearing a very loud shirt today, <laughs> Andrew Dowling here. And I asked my co-host Mitch Kurtz to also wear a loud shirt and he said no, um, which was pretty sensible. But hey, Mitch, how are you doing? Got to keep it. Uh, somebody's got to keep up the um, the appearance in this place. So yeah, but just, yeah. just for the record, no one is taking you seriously. Yeah, um, well, that's why I need the shirt. Ah, oh, of course, of course. Um, okay. <laughs> we are very fortunate to have with us today a very special guest, um, someone who, despite the last two years of living through COVID, we have managed to meet once in person and, and we'll hopefully do so again. But right now we've got him on a Zoom call. It is Tom Arkell, who is a postdoctoral researcher based out of Swinburne. Tom, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Um, I know that uh, some people who might follow um, might have seen some of your work and on different platforms around um, cannabis and driving. And I know we've got quite a bit to um, to dive into there. But before we do, can you just give us a bit of a, a background um, about yourself, how you got into um, sort of researching cannabis and, and driving? Yes, I'm a behavioral pharmacologist or a psychopharmacologist by training, which means essentially I'm, I'm interested in how drugs affect uh, the brain and behavior. Uh, as to how I got interested in cannabis and driving, I, it, was, it was sort of a bit of a happy accident. I, was, um, fin I finished my undergrad years ago at Sydney University. Uh, I was living overseas for a while. I came back uh, and I started a meeting with Professor Ian McGregor there. Uh, I was working as a research assistant for a bit um, and this was just about the time that the Lambert Initiative kind of came into being and was founded. And I really had the opportunity there to, to uh, get stuck into some, uh, well, into my PhD, but the option to, to sort of, I suppose, figure out what area I wanted to go into and find something that was topical and relevant and driving seemed to me one of those things that uh, a lot of people were interested in. There was kind of a lot of mystique around uh, and also not all that much research into. I mean, pretty much everything had just focused on just THC, dronabinol, and that's not really the way that people are still uh, interacting with cannabis mm. anymore. Mm. So I kind of took that and, and ran with it and became a cannabis and driving person. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't really planned, um, but I found myself in it and uh, I really enjoy it. I think it's a, a fascinating area and I've had the opportunity, you know, to, to move to the Netherlands for a bit and now to Melbourne and to work with some, some, some really fantastic people. So... Yeah, that's, and to people that's sort of like people are like, oh, there's Tom. He's the cannabis driving guy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe they, they haven't said it to me, but maybe. <laughs> what ha what happens if they do make it completely legal to drive on? Then you'd be out of business. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh dear. Well, you know, I, there's this is a very topical, uh, as you would be aware, very topical part of the cannabis. Uh, industry at the moment driving can i drive on cannabis what are the rules how does it work um there's a heated debate we've seen a lot of um movement politically as well fiona Patton um flying that flag for us on, on um having reasonable limits um but maybe it's better to, to ask the behavioral pharmacologist a few questions to to, <laughs> to see uh where we start with all this and and, and I, I guess the best place to start is can i I'm, you know, I've just started my cannabis treatment. Am I allowed to drive? So please answer from your perspective, um, your experience or your, your research uh, around THC, CBD, and um, we'll get into it further from there. Well, first of all, legally, you're not allowed to drive in Australia if you have any THC in your system. Uh, Tasmania is the only jurisdiction in which you can be exempt from uh, criminal penalties or prosecution uh, if you're found to be driving with any detectable amount of THC in your system. So there's, there's a defense as a patient there, but for every other jurisdiction in Australia, it's an offense to be operating a vehicle with any amount of THC in your system, regardless of whether you're a patient or not. Yeah, so I guess that brings, you know, the, the follow-up question to that is how much THC is detectable? When you, uh, when you do get swabbed? Um, so the cutoffs, so look, the law says it, it's zero. You're not allowed to have any amount in your system. Mm -hmm. uh, the way the actual detection works in practice with roadside drug testing is that the devices that please you, they have a, a cutoff. It's sort of the lowest amount of THC that they can reliably uh, detect. 
Um, we don't actually know what those cutoffs are because police don't uh, reveal what the cutoffs are for the devices that they're using. So we're not actually sure what that what that threshold is. Mm. Uh, it's above zero, but it's not it's not made publicly available what that actual number is. So it's a <laughs> I, I, I can't give you a much clearer answer than that, unfortunately. I, I'd heard speculation around the figure and you know you know as a disclaimer this is just speculation but but around the figure of somewhere about 0.8 milligrams is some something i've heard does that sound like it could be a reasonable uh not really no, no. okay uh, I, maybe but i don't think so so there, there's an australian standard for um, confirmation of oral fluid so when when a sample gets sent off to a lab and they confirm actually whether whether there is thc in, in it or not there is a cutoff and that's around 15 nanograms per mil. So right. that's like a sort of standard Australian standard for, for confirmation, but that's a little bit different from the number uh, that would be associated with the, the roadside drug testing devices. Right. So it's somewhere, it's somewhere above 15 nanograms per mil. We don't know exactly what it is, um, but in a sense, it, it sort of doesn't really matter because the law is actually zero. And so any, any amount above that is, um, you know, just sort of um, a process thing and, and accounting for potential error. What, what is interesting as well, I think, is that, I mean, yeah, so anyone who's listening to this who might be taking a CBD isolate product is probably thinking, well, I don't have to, to worry about any of this stuff. Um, obviously, it's, it's for people um, taking, and it could be a very trace amount of THC in a broad spectrum oil or something like this, but they're the ones that would, would need to potentially be worried. But given that the test itself is a saliva test, is it not the case that if somebody were to say be even taking a 50-50 or sorry, a one-to-one -one ratio CBD to THC oil in a capsule form where they're ingesting it, that they don't really have to um, worry about being detected? I, I know that that might seem like an irresponsible thing to posit, but I, I just, I'm really dealing with the limitations on the test itself rather than um, telling people to do that. Yeah, look, so looking for THC in saliva is really about um, detecting what's, uh, they say contamination of the oral cavity. That's sort of the, the technical term, but it's really just what gets stuck in your mouth when you use cannabis in any way that it comes into contact with your mouth. So if you smoke it, if you vape it, if you eat it, if you if, if it's a sublingual oil that you drop under your tongue, all of those routes of administration will lead to some amount of THC being detectable on your saliva. You're absolutely right. If you take a capsule uh, and there's an oil, say, that's inside a capsule and you swallow it and no THC actually physically comes into contact with your mouth, you're very unlikely to have THC in your system. It doesn't really appear to recirculate from your blood uh, back into your saliva. Now, of course, I'm not um, by any means advocating that people yeah. um, do this, but based on what we know about um, the way that THC is distributed in the body, uh, what's there in saliva really seems to be just sort of what gets stuck there uh, when you actually use it. So only if it actually physically comes into contact with your mouth, do you yeah. seem to have THC in your saliva? Yeah. So, and that's, so that's, you know, vaping, um, smoking. Um, yeah. As you said, sublingual, all of those things. Um, and so, okay. Um, and when we look at, I guess, your research sphere of, um, I guess, just, really analyzing the degree of impairment. Um, and I know that there is, you know, multi-factor um, analysis here to, to, but how maybe we can sort of dive deeper, but as a starting point, um, I, I think I saw in, in your paper that somebody who is say 0.05 blood alcohol reading is actually at a greater risk. I think he's 1.3 to 1.8 times at risk compared to a sober person of, of causing a crash. Whereas somebody um, who's had an amount of THC is lower than that. So what, what is the kind of um, what observations can we, can we make about how THC impairs driving? Mm. So that, that's uh, the crash risk stuff all comes from this epidemiological literature, which is a little different from the kind of lab work we do. So that the epidemiological stuff is, is looking at a population level. Is there an association between having THC in your system uh, and being involved in a crash? And, and you're absolutely right. I mean, from, from the evidence we have in front of us, it seems that overall the crash risk associated with having any amount of THC in your system, somewhere around 1.3 to 1.5, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite a tricky thing 
to measure. Uh, and the, the main reason that it's tricky is because just because you have THC in your system, it doesn't mean that that was the contributing factor to the crash. And that's where the crash risk numbers come from. You know, are you more likely to crash if you have THC in your system? But, um, you know, say you had, say you were found with like one and a half nanogram per mil THC in your blood. And for someone that uses it daily, a patient, for example, that's using a relatively high dose of THC frequently, they could have that much in their blood days after they had last used cannabis. So in that case, that would look like someone um, that, you know, where, where THC was at least partially responsible for the crash if they didn't have any other drugs in the system, but it may not have actually been um, the contributing factor. Now, so that, that's sort of one way in which those, those numbers might get a little biased upwards or, or downwards. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's why, you know, so, so the number that you're referring to, um, that was for a, from a paper that we recently uh, put out. And for that, we just took results from a number of recent meta-analyses. So meta-analysis takes a whole lot of other papers before it and condenses that all uh, into a single number. And if you look at a lot of the individual um, papers that came before that, some of them would say your crash risk is 10 times higher with cannabis. Some say it's, it's no higher at all. There are a couple of really big studies a big one in the US uh, that was done in Virginia Beach that found there was actually no increase in crash risk at all when people had cannabis in the system. So it's a really tricky thing to, to figure out. Like alcohols, you know, the, time and time again across studies, the results are pretty consistent. Mm. With cannabis, it's like it's totally different uh, every time depending on, you know, a whole, a whole host of factors. So that it can be a tricky thing to measure. But if you look at those last few meta-analyses where People have tried to take the best studies, the ones with the least um, sort of amount of confounding issues or biases. Um, the, yeah, the crash risk overall does seem to be around 1.5, which is, as you say, lower than the overall crash risk associated with, with a BAC of 0.05. Yeah. What, what are some of those factors out of curiosity? What, what does determine whether or what are you looking at when you're thinking about cannabis and driving? Um, so th things like um, the time of day, which crashes are... You know, if, if it's if you're just looking at crashes between 7 p.m. and 3 a.m. on a Saturday night, you're going to get different numbers because you have different people driving on the road. It's not really representative of you know your, your average population. Yeah. Um, depends on how the control cases, so how THC is detected in the control cases. So often in these sorts of studies, if someone's involved in a crash, um, they'll take a blood sample because often they they legally have to. But for a control driver, that's someone who's just driving along the road. Um, someone pulls them over and says, hey, we're doing this roadside survey. We're trying to understand more about crash risk. Um, can you give us a, a sample uh, so we can see how much THC you have in your system? And then you're comparing, you know, is, is someone that has THC in the system actually more likely to crash or not? But because it's pretty hard just to, you know, sort of uh, get someone to pull down their window and take a blood sample. People generally don't just want to sort of hang, hang your arm out your window and let anyone take a blood sample. Uh, in that case, they may be more likely to take saliva. So in a situation like this, you've got saliva THC being used for controls and blood THC being used for uh, the crash drivers. The issue there is that THC is detectable in blood for way longer than it is uh, in saliva. Yes. So you're, you're getting different sort of, uh, uh, you're, you're gonna get different numbers just based on, on that alone. The other thing is refusal rates. Uh, a lot of, you know, if you're not forced to, if you just get pulled over and say, do you wanna give, um, do you want to give saliva so we can see, you know, how much THC people generally have in the system? If you have THC in your system, you're probably going to say no. So that's going to affect your results the other way, where your, you know, your control driver is going to look like your control drivers have less THC in the system overall, or there's there's a, a lower prevalence of THC in your control drivers compared to your crash drivers, uh, in which case your results are going to be affected as well. So your crash risk is going to look a little bit different. Um, so there's there's a whole lot of things like this. Whereas with alcohol, to, to give you sort of the, um, the comparator, with alcohol, it's really easy to get a breathalyzer, take a BAC reading from someone that's just driving down the road and from someone that's involved in a crash. Uh, and also because there's a good relationship between the amount of alcohol in your blood and what's in your breath, um, you don't really have that issue where you're dealing with, you know, saliva in one case and blood in the other, like with cannabis. With alcohol, you're getting pretty much the same numbers, uh, whichever way you look at it. So... The, you know, the, there's a number of other things as well, um, but those are probably some of the main factors that may influence what that crash risk uh, looks like. Yeah. You're saying that you could have, you could maybe not have even smoked for three or four days and still fail a blood test technically based on 
Yeah, it's very possible to still have more than zero nanogram per mil THC. So nanogram per mil is just the sort of most commonly used uh, unit because because the amount of THC we're talking about is actually a very it's a very tiny amount, which mm. is why we're in nanograms. Uh, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can still have a detectable amount in your blood for someone that uses it regularly, um, days after you last used it. I think and, it's up to about a week generally in blood. Is sort of and then best. you're also saying it's different, or if I heard correctly, um, for somebody who might be a, a, a chronic user and have built somewhat of a tolerance, um, it's just not affecting them. Or am I getting it? Is that correct when I'm saying it's not affecting them in the same way that it might use somebody who uses cannabis maybe more sporadically? That's 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 true, but also, I mean, just to do with the blood thing, it's probably, a, yeah, I mean, both of those are true. But for someone that's using it all the time, um, number one, THC is really lipophilic, so it, it's, um, it's readily absorbed into fat, uh, which means it's stored in the body over quite a long period of time. It can slowly be released um, back into the bloodstream. Uh, also, if you're, if you're a chronic user and you are using uh, higher amounts to get to, uh, whether it's relief, whether it's a therapeutic effect, or whether it's simply, you know, you, you kind of, that's the amount you want to achieve whatever state you're going for. Um, yeah, that, that, those things are all going to affect uh, how, how much is in your blood, how long it sticks around in your blood for, and also to what extent you may be uh, impaired. I think to, to get at what you, were, what you were asking there, for someone that uses it all the time, uh, and knows how it affects them. Um, given the same dose as someone that uses it infrequently, that person that uses it uh, regularly is, is much less likely to be uh, as impaired or as affected. Now, of course, you know, for someone that uses it more frequently, they're probably also going to be using a higher dose. So it, it's not like it's a really neat sort of equation, but assuming that you gave two people exactly the same dose of THC, someone who say smokes, you know, what maybe once in a blue moon, and someone that is using it every day, the person that uses it every day is likely going to be far less affected than the person that uses it very occasionally. So, so what are these, uh, these effects that uh, THC is having that our policy reflects, you know, it being illegal with? So is there anything in THC or any responses to THC that are alarming and should be considered dangerous when driving? Look, there's not really any doubt that when given um, acutely, so when you give someone a single dose of THC and you, and you measure it right afterwards, um, there are clear impairments on a range of different uh, mental functions, I suppose. The classic one's memory, short-term memory impairment. Uh, this is probably the most well-characterized and it's a pretty well-established thing that um, THC does uh, impair your short-term memory. Uh, that probably has very little relevance for driving but that's probably the most kind of classic effect that people uh, would know about. Um, attention's another big one. So you find that someone who is acutely uh, intoxicated with cannabis tends to find it a bit more difficult to, uh, number one, sustain, to focus their attention on something for a long period of time, but number two, to switch effectively between different things that are competing for your attention. So you can imagine that having relevance for driving. If you're driving down a road and you've got you know, I mean, th th there's a lot of stuff going on when you're driving, right? You kind of get used mm. to it because it's a very well rehearsed skill. Um, but you're dealing with the, the sort of motor stuff where you're managing your feet and pedals and your steering wheel. Um, you're switching between things in your peripheral vision. Uh, you're trying to look ahead far enough so you can, uh, you know, respond preemptively in case you need to break suddenly. You're dealing with uh, lights, someone that pops up around the corner. There's like a lot of stuff going on in your visual field, as well as the, the motor stuff that goes on while you're driving. So the inability, or not the, necessarily the inability, but your reduced ability to switch between different tasks effectively, uh, that certainly does have relevance for driving. Um, so there's some, there's some things like this uh, that, you know, and, and to, to go back to that point before, if you've never used cannabis before and someone gives you a joint and you smoke half the joint and you get in your car, you almost certainly shouldn't be driving. You're really going to struggle with those things. The attention things, uh, reaction time, you're probably going to be less likely to respond effectively to a sudden hazard. Um, so there are, there are these sort of prototypical cannabis effects, uh, which certainly can have detrimental effects for driving. Now, the magnitude of those effects, uh, like we're getting at a minute ago, does sort of dissipate over time with someone that's using it regularly uh, and someone that's using, for example, a patient that's using pretty low doses of THC to manage um, symptoms for someone like that, you know, they, they may have detectable levels of THC in their bloodstream, but not really exhibit any of those uh, sort of classical impairment 
uh, science, like the, 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 the memory thing, the attention thing. Um, but, but we do know pretty clearly that uh, those are effects that cannabis does, does produce. Yeah, that's pretty what, unequivocal. unequivocal. I guess when we then look at where, you know, public policy has intervened to set benchmarks where it allows a level of, say, I'm thinking of alcohol, yeah. I mean, short-term memory is possibly not as affected um, with alcohol, but I, I'm sure you know, attention is, and, you know, there are other things that are kind of a little bit more unique to alcohol consumption and driving that you wouldn't see in, in cannabis. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think probably, I mean, like you say, the attention, absolutely. Um, alcohol absolutely slows down your ability to respond effectively and mm. to things, but the other thing's more of a, a sort of a personality thing. And that's around risky driving and aggression. And this is kind of the classic thing with alcohol. You know, you get in your car, you're above 0.05. You think you're absolutely fine. You think you're not going to have any problems. You think you're an amazing driver um, and that you can take a few more risks. You have that sort of overconfidence that people often associate with alcohol intoxication. And you sort of see the opposite with cannabis. Mm. But generally, if someone's stoned um, or they're most, more stoned than they want to be, the last thing they want to do is get in a car and drive. Yeah. So people are often... Um, quite aware of their impairment with cannabis. You sort of know uh, if you're in a state where you shouldn't be driving and you're more likely to make a responsible decision because it's, you know, you'd, you'd probably rather open a bag of chips than hop in the car uh, and drive somewhere. And that's, so that's one thing that is very different with alcohol, that the overconfidence and the risky driving that are very typical alcohol effects, that's just not, not what you see with cannabis. It doesn't tend to make people more risky. If anything, uh, people tend to drive more carefully. They often are aware that they may be a little bit impaired and so they try and compensate for that by driving a bit more carefully, a bit more slowly. Uh, now that I think I could, I've actually gotten to a point now where I think I can spot when I'm on the road on the occasional times that I've seen somebody driving where I think that they're on cannabis. <laughs> it's the person that's driving 30 Ks an hour in the one <laughs> kilometer lead up to a McDonald's drive through <laughs> I just, I like that person is absolutely just, yeah. It reminds me. Of, it reminds me of a story um, from from university days. Actually, a friend of mine uh, had, was driving on on cannabis, and he um, said that he stopped um, for ten minutes to let an echidna cross the road, only to realise that it was a pine cone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's definitely a different set of behaviours than um, than alcohol. That's for sure. I, I would say, but um, yeah. yeah, still that that's, it's questionable if that's somebody you'd want on, on the road yeah. as well. And then the, the alcoholic driver just went, no, nah, I'm not letting that, you know, a kidney, <laughs> no. I'm going to swerve around it. Um, don't worry about it. It's just a pine cone when it is an <laughs> echidna. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's um, yeah. Tip, well, that, I mean, that kind of brings me to my next question, which is um, well, the, the typical behaviors, but the, but c CBD, mm. Is that something that we, you know, people are asking us all the time? Can I drive if I'm taking CBD? Um, we'd love to have the word from a guest on the show. So rather than us just saying yes, <laughs> but but what are some of the things people should be looking out for if taking CBD and driving? Whether there's any THC in there, <laughs> I think that's yeah. Really, yeah. probably really the only thing. I mean, we we did the first ever study a couple of years ago to look at this. We did this in the Netherlands on-road driving study where we took people out driving in traffic, 100 kilometers, highway driving uh, under a, a range of different conditions, whether they receive just THC, THC combined with CBD, just CBD and placebo. And in the just CBD condition where they just vaporized CBD, we saw absolutely no impairment at all. So no, no difference from placebo. Um, so this was the first study to look at that in relation to driving. But I think from everything else we know around um, CBD is that generally there's not really anything to worry about. If you're taking huge doses, 2,000, 3,000 milligrams, um, there's some evidence that that can cause a bit of sedation. But in the sorts of doses that most people uh, are generally using, particularly when they're using it as a wellness product, uh, I don't see any reason why people should be concerned about driving with, with, with CBD. The only issue is if there's some THC in there, particularly if people are buying black market products, uh, and you get pulled over and you do happen to have THC in your system. That's to me, that's where mm. the issue is not in CBD producing any serious effects by itself. And does that, does that apply to 
all other, I guess, cannabinoids other than THC, which, you know, don't effectively um, intoxicate quite the way that THC does? Um, we don't look probably yes, but we don't really know. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's other, you know, for example, Delta eight THC, which is yeah, now coming quite a thing that. in the U S not good, <laughs> probably not good. Um, yeah. but if you're talking about sort of CBG or a lot of these other minor cannabinoids that are generally present in very low amounts, uh, to my knowledge, there's nothing really to be worried about. And also people are very unlikely to be using them in big enough amounts that they're going to be having serious pharmacological, uh, activity. Does Delta-8 get picked up in the saliva test? Probably shouldn't ask that. Uh, no, the, the truth is I'm actually, I'm actually not sure. Um, there's a very good chance that it would be cross-reactive with Delta-9 THC and that it would come back positive. Yeah, I think yeah. It's, it's probably safe to assume the answer is yes, but I don't actually know for sure. Okay. Um, now, I wanted to ask a little bit just about your other research projects at Swinburne. So I know that they've got, if I understand, basically as part of the faculty, they have driving simulation um, and, and all these, these um, very fancy research tools. But yeah, what kind of other um, research are you doing? What other substances are you looking into? Yeah. So uh, my, my colleague, Dr. Amy Haley, she's, she's running a number of, of pretty cool studies at the moment, at least has, has finished a couple of them recently and a couple that are about to be finished. Uh, some in the past looking at um, ketamine, dexmedetomidine, um, uh, methamphetamine, amphetamine, Ritalin. So she's got a whole whole program uh, really uh, with, with a big focus on amphetamines actually at the moment and really about how they're affecting um, gaze behavior. So lots of stuff with eye tracking, uh, yeah. looking at you know what's happening when you're driving uh, under the effects of, of different amphetamines. There's also studies going on at the moment with benzodiazepines. So uh, we've, we've got a pretty comprehensive sort of suite of research. I, I would say we're covering most of our drugs pretty well mm. <laughs> yeah. at the moment. Uh, I was actually a, a participant in one of her studies recently, which was looking at methamphetamine and driving. And <laughs> so um, I think we how many, to... how many How many cities did you cross? <laughs> <laughs> So so had a, to talk us through what was involved in this one uh, a glass pipe i assume um uh no a, a capsule okay uh well, actually a couple of capsules so four sessions combinations of methamphetamine and alcohol uh and you know normally i'm the one running these studies so for a start it's a little bit funny just to be uh, <laughs> you know, the participant so it's probably you know it's, it's quite interesting actually when you're doing this whole time to, to sort of see it from the other point of view i think it probably helps hopefully helps me to do my job better um <laughs> But yeah, no, that, that was a, that was an interesting one. Being given a couple of capsules and then um, driving for an hour, that was sort of the main focus. Uh, I, I think I can probably safely say that driving for an hour under placebo is really boring. Driving for an hour when you've been given a few capsules of what may or may not be methamphetamine, is um, it, the time goes by a lot quicker. <laughs> <laughs> You're only driving for, <laughs> what, five minutes and then it was all done? Five um, to ten minutes. That's, that's yeah. what it's saying. Like. <laughs> And so I'm, I'm actually interested in that, that um, I guess the, the gaze and the, the timing of, you know, for I, I, that point that you raised before about just, you know, what's competing for your attention when you're driving is obviously the, what has given rise to the concerns that police have about mobile phone use. Um, and especially because even in a vehicle like the, you know, your sort of, uh, your vision straight ahead, you, you've got the dashboard, you've got everything. But if you then look down at, you know, something, your phone lights up, even if you're not actually actively using it, that distracts you. What can you tell us about how um, different drugs, alcohol, amphetamines, cannabis kind of interact with, with your gaze in a vehicle? It really depends on the drug. I mean, totally different effects with different kinds of drugs. Mm. Ben, benzodiazepines, Xanax, Valium, they tend to make you sleepy. Um, you know, people become sedated and they have, they have trouble just simply staying awake and, and paying attention. You know, you just yeah. kind of drift off. Uh, amphetamine- It's perfectly legal, just to clarify, it's perfectly legal to drive on these substances, right? Um, it's, it's not illegal to drive while you have them in your system. It's, it's, you can, it, it's a separate offense if you get caught, uh, if you're driving impaired. Yeah. And that's attributable to a substance, but just having the, the substance alone in your system 
is not enough to, to you know, to, to, to. And it's not part of the roadside testing that they're testing for, you know. No. Yeah. Okay. And that includes heavy duty opioids. Benzodiazepines. Yeah. Amphetamines, MDMA, methamphetamine. Yes. Um, but there's there's plenty of other drugs on that are that are well known to produce uh, impairment, different kinds of impairment um, that are not being being tested for. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, sorry, I I, I go. So yeah, you were saying that the different types of substance will determine your gaze yeah. and attention, and yeah. So with exactly. with alcohol kind of, and cannabis, you can kind of break them down by the different categories. People often often think of them as as being on. so depressants. Uh, alcohol is probably the most classic depressant, GHP, um, benzodiazepines kind of fall under the same category. Then you've got your stimulants, things like cocaine, amphetamines. Uh, you've got your psychedelics, uh, which to my knowledge isn't probably a huge, there's not, there's not too many people driving around um, on acid. But, you know, again, another class of drug with a, with a different sort of suite of effects that have relevance for, for your gaze and driving. But going they, back to they're driving, mean, but they're just at home in their lounge room. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <Yeah. laughs> but going back to the amphetamines, um, they, they're, they're performance enhancing drugs. Yeah. You know, methamphetamine has quite a long history uh, of use as a, as a military aid. Yeah. Because um, it keeps you awake and focused. So mm. in, in some sense, um, an acute dose of an amphetamine uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, is probably actually going to make you a better driver uh, by some metrics, by by sort of you know metrics on paper. Now that doesn't mean in the real world that um, your driving is going to be better if you just yeah uh, you know taken amphetamine. That's absolutely not the case. Um, <laughs> but they tend to make people more focused and attentive, which is why you know Ritalin so widely prescribed uh, for ADHD, methylphenidate. So, um, Does that extend to cocaine as well? Cocaine's a little bit difficult. Cocaine um, is a bit messier. Much, it's a much more intense and euphoric uh, drug than than some of those prescription amphetamines. Mm. So, look, into, if you were to give someone a bit of cocaine in the lab and you measured their reaction time compared to placebo, they would probably be responding a little bit quicker. That doesn't mean they're going to be a safer or a better driver. Absolutely not. Um, yeah. But in some ways, that's sort of the, the prototypical stimulant effect is to increase your reaction time, uh, sorry, decrease your reaction time, make you faster um, and, and more focused. So that was the thing with, with methamphetamine is, you know, maybe if you're driving for an hour, the time, I, I felt the time went by quicker and I felt like I was, you know, paying really good attention. I was really focused, but it could be that what I was doing was really, I sort of had this tunnel vision thing where you're really focusing the whole time on what's ahead and you're deeply focused on that. But in doing that, you're losing the ability to really focus on what's happening in your periphery. So you become mm. hyper-focused on a particular task, yeah. um, which yeah, means gotcha. you're not able to switch effectively between different things, like what we're saying before uh, with cannabis. So what, what about the, the two drugs that have kind of been um, discussed of late, um, MDMA and psilocybin? You know, we've been talking about them potentially being down scheduled. They weren't recently, but it doesn't mean they won't in the future. Um, so how, how do they interact with driving? Do, you, do we have much data on that? No, I, I don't think anyone's done any, any research looking at um, MDMA or psilocybin and driving. I mean, there hasn't really been a need to. Yeah. yeah um, I think, and surely at the moment, it, it comes back to that point you were saying around the length of time that, um, certain substances take to be metabolized and then excreted from the body. Uh, you know, I just imagine that if, for example, somebody were blood tested and they did find traces of, say, psilocybin or um, obviously MDMA, but yeah, psilocybin or LSD or something like that, I imagine the police wouldn't um, look too kindly on that. No, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Mm. Yeah, I think this is uh you know this is probably where we're at with can well where we've been at with cannabis over the last five years as the laws change and as as we're sort of changing as society the way we look at it and the way we interact with it as you know as, as less of this sort of terrible demonic drug to more of a thing that's obviously being widely used and maybe isn't quite as bad as we thought it was and people are using it now um, quite widely for therapeutic purposes we're sort of having to engage with all these questions around driving and drug driving and what does that mean and is this fair for patients all these questions that are, are coming up now we may be in a similar um, case with, with with mdma and psilocybin in future but the thing to remember is you know mdma and psilocybin the acute effects are far far stronger than than the effects of cannabis unless you unless you accidentally you know 
ingest like eight brownies uh, and you're suddenly in a catatonic state for two days, which can happen. With Accidentally. Yeah. yeah. Oops. <laughs> or, or on purpose. But, you know, very high dose of THC can, can cause really quite significant side effects. Yeah. I was going to um, say as well, I mean, just thinking about the way that um, our courts currently enforce, um, you know, uh, blood alcohol breaches. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we have this thing in Victoria, you'd probably be aware, you know, the interlock device mm -hmm. that um, if you're... I actually don't know the specifics around what your prior history of, of, you know, having been caught over the legal limit has to be in order to be, have your vehicle fitted with one of these devices. But essentially the premise is that you have to blow into it, it not detect any alcohol in order for you to be able to start your car and drive, yeah. you know, is as part of the drive change campaign, which I know you, you and, and, many others are doing great work in connection with is there any talk about that i know there's talk about having limits of safe limits of thc to to enable people to you know take med medical cannabis but if we had someone say who was repeatedly is there any talk of something as sophisticated as that or would it just simply be that you just would have your license suspended and that's that's it I don't think we're going to ever end up in that place uh, with cannabis, like a sort of equivalent to an interlock system, um, really because, and this is the same reason why I'm, I'm not an advocate for setting any um, strict uh, permissible THC levels in blood or saliva, is because there's not any good scientific rationale um, for doing that. The amount of THC you have in your system is very poorly related to the amount of cannabis you've consumed, when you last consumed it, uh, and how impaired you are. And so to mm -hmm. me, that's, those are, you know, that's like the opposite of what we have with alcohol, where there's a very good relationship between the amount of alcohol you have in your system, how much you've consumed, and how impaired you probably are. And that's why BAC works well. That's why mm -hmm. it's sort of a sensible thing to have a BAC limit. And that's why you have uh, interlock, because you have a reliable method for detecting whether someone has very recently consumed alcohol or not. Yeah, um, with cannabis, uh, you, you just you don't have that. I mean, like we said before, if you ingest a capsule, you don't have any THC in your saliva. If you smoke a joint compared to if you were to eat uh, a brownie, the amount of uh, the peak level of THC in your saliva, or in your blood rather, so the highest amount that you have, is way way higher after smoking than it is after after eating. Um, even if you, so I mean, for example, if you had like 50 milligrams of THC in a brownie and you consume that, uh, you know, by ingestion, you swallow it and it gets absorbed through your gut compared to if you, if you smoke two and a half milligrams of THC, so a way lower dose, you in all likelihood would still have a higher peak THC concentration in your blood after smoking than you would by eating. Uh, now that doesn't mean that you're more impaired. It just, the pharmacokinetics or the way that THC moves through your body is very different depending on how you consume it. So if you smoke it, it's rapidly absorbed through your lungs into your bloodstream. If you eat it, it's absorbed slowly through your gut and it takes an hour or two to reach, uh, to reach peak level. So this is, this is kind of really- and, and, Sorry, issue. can I just jump in and add that anyone that's ever had a brownie before just knows that like, yeah, edibles are highly intoxicating. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I yeah. It's that that is crazy that that it might be you know you only maybe have a puff of a of a, a joint or a vape or something and that suddenly just instantly enter your blood much you know at a more rapid pace. Um, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's the issue with using um, any you know that's the issue with using THC in your whatever the biological matrix is whether that's blood saliva urine which, whichever way you look at it there's just not a good relationship between the amount of THC in your system and how impaired you are. Alcohol yeah. is a very good relationship. It's not perfect, but at 0.05, you know, we're pretty confident that most people are going to be a little bit impaired. In fact, we know for sure that most people are a little bit impaired at 0.05. Some people aren't really chronic alcoholics are probably absolutely fine, fine to drive at 0.05, but on the whole, the vast majority of people are going to be a bit impaired at 0.05. And we sort of accept this as a society. That it's like a balance between, your civil liberties uh, and, you know, like a road safety risk. And that's, that's kind of what it comes down to. It's like a, a balance between those two things. Mm. And I suppose where we may go with cannabis is, is how can we establish 
a similar thing uh, in future if we were to go down that route and what would that look like and it's really tricky because of because of this issue that there isn't a good relationship between the amount of THC in your system and how impaired you are and that's that's not going to get any better no matter whether we do more research more studies we're not going to get a you know a better picture of that that's just how it is and do you do, think, do you think that's oh. <laughs> Um, I'm going to have one. Of in. Um, I, I just was going to ask if uh, you are sort of sensing that they will, that the first step at least in terms of making progress in this space will be to set those metrics of a legally acceptable threshold for THC in a, in a saliva test. And yeah, what are your thoughts on, on that? Look, I, I've really got no idea. I don't know how this is going to play out here. I mean, I think at the end of the day, from the police point of view, they're worried about road safety and they're worried about the repercussions uh, of someone who's high potentially causing an accident and, and causing, you know, some kind of road um, traffic accident or injury. And I think that that's where they're coming from. Um, in terms of like legal thresholds, in the US uh, and Canada, a lot of states have... Um, permissible blood THC levels, they call them per se limits. So if we have more than that amount, it's deemed to be an offense. And those generally range between two and five nanogram per mil uh, in blood. In a way, we have that here with the roadside drug testing, like I said at the start of this, because we have that detection threshold, um, that's, that's really like a, a function of the device, a sort of a technological function of the device. We do in effect have a per se uh, level. It's just that none of us know what it is. <laughs> but, but we do... We but we can assume progress. it's close to zero rather than five. Uh, it's definitely above zero. Uh, it's probably above five as well, uh, but but we, we don't know what it is. Uh, okay. But five in blood is very different from five in saliva. So, oh, so two to five in blood is, yeah, that's very different to two in equivalent amount in, in saliva. So I, I don't know what this is going to look like. Um, I, I'm just, I'm, I, I don't think we should be setting uh, blood THC per se limits like that. I would much rather see a system where it's around functional impairment. Uh, we, at the moment, we don't have a, a good enough test for this, but I would like to see in the future some way where we're not looking at how much THC is in someone's system, but rather are they actually impaired uh, while they're driving? I think everyone would agree if someone's impaired while they're driving, that's a, you know, that's a threat and a risk to, to the broader population. And that's something to be dealt with you know, probably harshly. But, but yeah, but on the flip side of that, and I agree with you, but on the flip side of that, you could have somebody, for example, who, you know, is driving on a freeway in the far right lane, the fast lane, so to speak. And there, there's no one around. The speed limit's 100. They're, they're doing 120 on a straight road. Technically, you know, they're 20 over the limit, but they could be sober. You know, they're kind of, they're not presenting a threat necessarily to any other motorists they're just breaking a particular rule that um that's been set um yeah i just i i suppose is the idea that you'd actually have ai technology that would be able to almost just detect a car a vehicle's movement in a lane to sort of and its speed and just to sort of generally work to some sort of an algorithm that determines are the, is that vehicle um, driving or moving in a manner in which it could be assumed that the driver might be impaired. I don't know. That, so that's a whole, that's a whole nother thing. I'd like to go into that in a minute, but all I'm talking about is if, uh, you know, a police car is following someone and they happen to be weaving uh, or they're driving erratically and they get pulled over instead of going, do you have X thing in your saliva? Uh, it's, it's more of a test for functional impairment where, you look at, um, you know, compared to, and this, it's, this is a very hard thing to do, but in a sort of ideal situation, compared to that person's normal or baseline level, are they exhibiting cognitive impairment? Is there evidence that their attention reaction time, things like this that are really essential for driving are below what they should be? And if so, yes, then they get taken off the road. And then you try and figure out what the cause of that was, rather than a blanket thing where you could be driving perfectly fine, but you get pulled over and you're found to have X drug in your system, uh, and you're prosecuted on, on the basis of that. So, so, so I would rather see a system where people are being um, penalized for, uh, for, drive, for, for evidence that they're actually driving uh, erratically. I agree with you, but that's why those phrases like catching you before others get hurt, you know, and this whole, you know, we're going to set up a booze bus 
when you least expect it and we're going to catch you out and all of those sorts of things. I, I can understand it for alcohol, but I agree with you. I think, for example, if somebody is driving really badly, it does concern me that if they had opioids in their system, they're not going to ostensibly at least um, have anything detectable when the police does a saliva swab. But exactly. then it's, it's at the police's discretion as to whether or not they say, well, actually, we observed you and we think we need to take you down to the station and do a blood test and, and determine if, if there's a, a greater risk. Um, exactly. So sorry. I think the standards unfairly applied across different drug classes. And, yeah. you know, it's sort of quite easy to talk about like this, but in practice, it, it's a really difficult thing to do. And this is why no jurisdictions have been able to do this yet. Um, it's very hard to have a system like that where, you know, you can pull over only those people that are driving impaired, catch them when they're driving impaired and figure out exactly what it is that's causing that impairment. Um, instead of this sort of deterrent approach, uh, like you said before, with the booze buses and random drug testing. And, you know, the, the thing is, that's worked really well for alcohol. It's been incredibly effective uh, in reducing alcohol related accidents and fatalities. So the booze bus thing, the, the, random, the random testing, the deterrent thing, so people, you know, they're, they're scared and they're less likely to drive um, if, they, if they're over 0.05. Uh, and even just having a BAC limit in the first place, these things have all been uh, incredibly effective. So I think the thinking was, well, we can just apply that to other drugs. And it'd be nice if that worked, but um, it doesn't with cannabis for the reasons, you know, I mentioned previously. Mm. Um, so you're talking- We have to think about how, how we can maybe come up with another way uh, it, it, so that we can distinguish between someone that may have a detectable amount in the system, but that's absolutely fine to drive, and someone that is impaired and shouldn't be driving and does have a detectable amount of THC in their system. So you're talking about, we don't, I, I can't remember it, this ever happening to me in Australia, but certainly when you watch American movies and you see the cop pull somebody over on the, on the highway and they're like, all right, walk in a straight line or, or <laughs> perform some kind of, I don't even want to say skill move, but basic, basic cognitive function. And yeah. then if they fail that, then they're basically deemed unfit to drive. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Now those, so those tests are called standardized field sobriety tests and police do use them a bit here um, still too, but they're not very common. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit, they're a little bit outdated in the sense that they, they, they were all calibrated um, with respect to alcohol. So they work very well for, for detecting alcohol related impairment but they're less good with other drugs. They're not very sensitive to cannabis. So something along those lines, but I mean, think of maybe, pretend you could have a, a, an iPad based cognitive test that a driver could complete in less than two minutes. Uh, and that would give you a measure of, you know, how's this person performing? How's, the, how's their cognitive function? That's sort of a, you know, sort of like a, a gold standard thing to be working towards. And it's unlikely we're gonna be there anytime soon. But to me, that would be a more fair way um, similar to that US system, to, to look for functional impairment rather than simply the presence of a drug uh, in someone's system. Do you think, um, I, I did have a look at some of your research and do you think, um, rather than think, have you observed there to be differences between men and women in this, in cannabis uh, consumption and the responses they have? So, look, this is something that um, is becoming more uh, there's more attention being paid to this in research. And there's plenty of examples where men and women do differ in their responses or males and females um, to, uh, to different drugs. So there was a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, by, by a group in the US that we, we actually work with quite regularly. And they did a similar thing to our paper where they combined data for a number of studies and went, is there a difference in how males and females are responding uh, to cannabis? And so we wanted to do that. And, and they found there were some differences, but they, they were quite subtle. And so we wanted to replicate that. So we took data from um, two of our recent studies, the one in the Netherlands, the on-road one, and one that I ran in Sydney a couple of years beforehand. Uh, and we did exactly that. We, we looked at a whole range of measures. So cognitive performance, blood THT levels, how stoned people felt, how anxious people felt, how sedated people felt. And we didn't really find any differences at all. So there, there wasn't really any difference that male, uh, sorry, any evidence that males and females differed systematically in their response to acute cannabis effects. So that's, I, okay. I would say the jury's still a little bit out on this one. I think this is something that we really need to tap into a little bit more. I mean, in both of our studies, the one thing to remember is we used a relatively low dose of THC, 13.75 milligrams of THC, which is probably a bit below what a lot of, um, uh, more regular users might be using. 
Um, so th this is something we're going to try and probe a bit more in future research. But from 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 the research we've done so far, uh, we didn't see any differences. No. So um, just sort of you know we've been talking about um, you know very much this whole conversation is about at the individual level, you know what causes impairment, these sorts of things, and not to uh, steer us in a you know too philosophical a kind of um, direction, but. I did read this really interesting article um, in the Atlantic, which was sort of just talking about how there's this kind of myth that human error actually is responsible for um, crashes um, and, and in the road safety context. And I just want to read you a passage and get, get your thoughts. I have to put my reading glasses on for this one. Um, Seeking to find a single cause for a crash is a fundamentally flawed approach to road safety, but it underpins much of American traffic enforcement and crash prevention. And I think by extension, we can probably say Australia too. So after a collision, police file a report noting who violated traffic laws and generally ignoring factors like road and vehicle design. Insurance companies too are structured to hold someone accountable. Drivers aren't the only ones who face such judgments. Following a crash, a pedestrian might be blamed for crossing a street where there is no crosswalk, even if the nearest one is a quarter of a mile away. And a cyclist might be cited for not wearing a helmet, although a protected bike lane would have prevented the crash entirely. News stories reinforce these narratives with stories limited to the driver who was either speeding or the pedestrian who crossed against the light. And I think you can kind of almost extrapolate that out as well to um, this context around drug driving um but yeah do you kind of agree with that that sometimes we do in our approach focus too much on um single factors when we're looking at how to prevent or how to at least uphold road safety and that actually you know it's a broad ecosystem that's that's multi-variable um and and there's just so much more nuance than perhaps what our law enforcement um indicates I absolutely agree with that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I, to go back to the point, you know, where we started off when we're talking about epidemiological research and crash risk, is that we make a distinction between crash risk and crash responsibility. So crash risk is your, uh, the, the, the likelihood that you, you will be involved in a crash if you have THC in your system in this case, but you could apply it to alcohol or any other drug. Crash responsibility is your likelihood that you will actually be responsible for a crash. And I think this is what this gets down to, is how do you attribute uh, responsibility or blame uh, in an accident? And it's, uh, I think that's absolutely right. It's really difficult to do. Um, and it's, you know, it, it's very difficult to, to, to sort of attribute that to a single cause, whether that's a driver um, or a pedestrian, whatever it is, to, to attribute to a single thing is, is probably unrealistic. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. But I, I would make the point that that doesn't detract from our crash risk statistics because that is really looking at just whether you're more likely to be involved in a crash. It's not saying anything about whether you caused it or not. Yeah. But you know, if 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 it's like, it's only like you could say the same for like a, a really rainy, like a stormy day. You would that would surely automatically just increase everyone's risk across the board of being involved in a crash. It does. Yeah, exactly right. And whether it's a stormy day is going to increase crash risk as well. But if yeah. you know that people that have alcohol in the system, just to take a hypothetical example, you know, are generally 15 to 20 times more likely to be involved in a crash than someone that doesn't have alcohol in their system, you would be in a pretty good position to make a conclusion that, you know, that alcohol is likely um, increasing um, the chance that you'll be involved in a crash. Yeah, doesn't mean responsible, but you can you can sort of deduce that pretty pretty clearly. Um, yeah, but when we're talking about like one point two to one point three times, when we go to crash responsibility, it's it's a very tricky thing. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that point. Yeah, I, I'll have to look into some of those papers that you pulled the the meta analyses from because I yeah I, I think it's it's really interesting. But I just wanted to finish off. I think um, before we um, you know started recording you were telling us just before that you've got a new study coming up and i just wanted to hear about where your research is currently at what's your what's your current research focus yeah that, that's right so we've got we've got one study ongoing at the moment uh where we're looking at the detectability of different medicinal cannabis products in oral fluid so we have people come in for a single session uh and we look at whether they're testing positive using roadside drug testing equipment 
uh, and for how long. So I think we're, we're taking saliva samples for up to six hours uh, after people have taken whatever product they're normally mm -hmm. using. Uh, and, we're, and we're also measuring driving, cognitive performance, all the other stuff that we would normally do. So that's one, and we're still looking for participants for that. If anyone listening is someone who's using, uh, who has a legal valid prescription for medical cannabis and you're in the Melbourne area. Um, the other one though, that I think is really exciting is something we're about to kick off uh, in the next couple of weeks as well, where we're gonna be tracking uh, new patients for three months once they start uh, using medical cannabis. So for this, we're finding people, and we're, we're trying to capture them before they actually start using cannabis. So they've gone to see a doctor, they're about to get a script, um, but we wanna see them, have them come into the lab and before they actually start using cannabis for the very first time. So we get a baseline measure. So we look at, there's all gonna be chronic pain patients. So we look at what medications they're using, uh, their quality of life, pain symptom severity. Uh, and then once they start using cannabis, uh, we track them over a 12 week period and we bring them back into the lab at monthly intervals and we do the same thing again. So we take blood samples, uh, we see about the quality of life, has their pain uh, changed? Has it improved? Uh, how's their driving compared to baseline? Um, how's their confidence in their driving? Do they feel like their driving's impaired when they're using their medicine? Do they feel like they can drive okay? So I think this is a really, uh, uh, this is gonna run over a couple of years. And so uh, again, if you're listening to this um, and you're in a position where you're thinking about, uh, you know, moving towards uh, accessing legal uh, prescribed medical cannabis, um, please do get in touch. Uh, I, would, I would love to hear from you. Um, and we're gonna need uh, participants that, that are willing to take part in this. We, we, will, uh, we will gladly, we can get some links off you um, when we put this episode up. We'll be very happy to, to put the links there so that anyone listening can, um, can yeah, get in touch. Brilliant, yeah. So, so with this, we're, we're trying to sort of focus on what we're calling real world evidence. I mean, this isn't a clinical trial. It's not what the medical community would regard as a really sort of high quality, um, and rigorous trial. You're normally in a case of that would have people would have different groups. Some would receive placebo, some would receive an active drug. They would switch over. Everyone would be given exactly the same dose, and that's that's great in some sense. But we know now pretty clearly that's not how it really works with cannabis. People use a really wide range of different doses that work for them. They use different kinds of products, different formulations, different routes of administration. So with this, we're trying to really kind of get some real world evidence around this and go and also is we want to know over time, how does it change? You know, maybe it is that after one month, people are a little bit impaired, but, but by two months, once they're stable and they're used to the effects of THC, maybe they're fine to drive again. I mean, we don't know, but to me, that would be like a, a really kind of cool bit of data that we can then go, okay, now how do we turn this into useful advice for patients? And maybe we advise people not to drive for a few weeks once they start using their medicine. But then after that, you know, that, that maybe they're okay. Yeah, so I was going to say, good. surely the, yeah, for someone who suffers chronic pain, I imagine, in, you know, driving impairment is more at the end of baseline when they're not being medicated for that pain. And then they're suddenly, you know, they're in the car and they get this acute onset of, of pain that they, yeah. you know, might need to pull over, or, you know, as compared to stabilizing with, um, with medication that's working for them. Exactly right. Exactly. And, and it may also be that on the cocktail of opioids and uh, all sorts of other drugs that chronic pain patients are often on to manage, mm -hmm. uh, to manage the pain, maybe their driving is actually worse under those conditions than mm -hmm. if they're able say, to reduce their opioid use by 40% um, with a low dose of THC. I mean, it may be that THC is actually able to improve um, their, their driving by providing you know, relief of the underlying symptoms and helping to reduce their opioid use. Uh, as, as you probably know, you know opioids, generally uh, will impair your driving. Mm. Um, so we, we don't know if that's the case. That's, that's one possible, um, I suppose, theory about what, what the, the results may tell us. But I think this is a really interesting area of research and something that I'm, I'm really excited to be getting stuck into. Oh, it's, it's awesome research. Very important. Incredible. And mm. yeah, I, um, I'm yeah, really glad also to hear that you said it's going to be running over a few years. So I think there's going to be hopefully lots of data to, um, to unpack from it all. And, and really we'll be, uh, yeah, following that with a, with a bit of interest. Um, well, Mitch, did you have any more questions for Tom? Are we able to let him free now? We've, we've definitely, uh, held him captive for a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, he's provided a lot of insights and we will, we'll let you go this time. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, thanks so much, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Um, 
yeah, you're just a wealth of information um, on this topic and and many others. And I'm sure we will have you back on again if uh, if you want to be held captive for another hour <laughs> at some stage in the future. Gladly. All thanks, right. thanks for having me. I appreciate that. No Brilliant. worries. And thanks, until the next time we see you, we'll uh, take care. Cheers. Okay, guys. Bye-bye. Cheers.